Well, welcome everybody to uh, our last Sabbath here. But uh, beginning next Sabbath on September 7th, our meeting place moves to Northminster Presbyterian Church. Just uh, so I get the address on record for people who are going to view this online. That's at uh, 13001 North 35th Avenue, Phoenix. You enter the parking lot from Sweetwater Avenue. Anyway, uh, before I forget, I want to make sure I mention that today is the last day for those of you who want to go to the uh, camp that uh, Foothill Community Church is. Uh, having for everybody, uh, you need to email Jeremiah Owen. If anyone needs his email, let me know. Uh, if you know of anyone who's sitting on the fence, contact them today. And I hope to see as many of you as possible there. I'm going. Wednesday Bible study is uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, of course. And today we're having a sack lunch following the service in the fellowship hall. If you brought something, you're good. Like me, I'm going to run to Taco Bell and run back. Uh, so let me know if you want anything. I'll pick it up. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Let me do a quick uh, prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, all of your provision. And we thank you that you have provided this place for us for ever since we started a meeting in a church. And that you've been great for us. And, and now you've provided a place that is more affordable for us. We're looking forward to. Uh, Coming each Sabbath to be with you at our new location. I ask you to be with us today while we finish the last two things we have to take over there. I'd like to ask you to be with all of us here today, the church, be with all of our brothers and sisters who could not be here today. I just put your hand of Love and protection and healing on everyone who needs healing. And, uh, in the meantime, let us let us worship you today, Lord. Let us adore you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, our scripture reading today in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verses one through four. Is uh, Apostle Paul speaking here to uh, the group of the faithful? I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted. You put up with it easily enough. Okay. Um, when I chose this sermon and sermon title and the verses, well, whenever I do that, I, I usually go to the uh, New American Standard Bible. 
but it's like their translation, even though it's not quite as smooth, easy to read in English as the NIV is, or literal. And uh, today, when I read it to you, I read it out of the NIV, but in the um, New American Standard, where it uh, talks about the uh, other Christ, it says it as another Christ. And now I can't find it. Anyway, so that's how I got the time of uh, the title of my sermon, Another Jesus, Beware of Another Jesus. And what does that even mean? What is another Jesus? More than one? But there was just one. Well, there is one that is the true Jesus, but I, uh, oh, I see what I did wrong. No, I did. Okay. There is a, there are plenty of other Jesuses, or at least people who claim to be Jesus, or who Others claim are Jesus that are not the real Jesus. And if you want to know the difference, you just uh, look up for yourself. What does Jesus mean? Oh, I did. I went to that font of true knowledge that uh, is never wrong in any way called Wikipedia. But uh, okay, they are wrong in a lot of things, but this one is right. Jesus is uh, from it's a Latinized form of the Hebrew Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew same is what actually they were told they called Jesus when he was here on earth. And it means it's the same word that is sometimes rendered as Joshua. So like uh, Joshua that was Moses' right hand man that led the army of Israel into Israel, the army of Israel into the promised land. Name is the same as Jesus. And it means one who saves or one who is sent by the Lord to save. It means Savior. Well, right, but we know that means, you know, Jesus is the Savior, He's the Messiah. But who are these other Jesuses? Well, I looked one up, and he is, uh, he was called Bar Jesus. I want to look in Acts 13, verses, starting at verse 5. Now, when they reached Salamis, starting at verse 5, when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their help. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Bar Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Elamus, the guy that called himself Bar Jesus, 
But Elymas the magician, or so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And then Paul set him straight. He struck him blind for a while. Show him. Show the proconsul that this man was not of the faith. Bar Jesus. That means son of Jesus, son of Joshua. But there's another Jesus, but I don't think I don't think any of these other Jesuses are the ones that are being talked about in the scripture verse today. Like uh, Joshua, the right hand man of Moses. You know, he's his name was the same as Jesus's, but he wasn't like another Jesus, as in not the real Jesus. He, he didn't claim to be the real Jesus. No one else claimed he was the real Jesus. Our Jesus, he was not recognized as the real Jesus. So he wasn't really qualified as another Jesus. When the Bible says, you know, we're born just against being being aware, being be, to be aware of another Jesus. They mean someone who either claims they are Jesus. Right? I think even more than that, it means someone who others identify as Jesus, but who is not. Or someone who has characteristics other than the real Jesus. And if you really want to know what some of those are, I can tell you because I was not always a Christian. And on my road to salvation, I came across a few of these other Jesuses. Now, it started when I was a young child. I was raised Catholic, Roman Catholic. Any of you out there are Catholic or have been, I'm not trying to put you down for that. Uh, like I said, I always was for a long time. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think we were being told to worship one of the other Jesus. And I think it was through the sacrament of confession, we were being asked to do that. At least that's where the rubber met the road. So I remember when I was a child, I would go to confession. Right? First of all, I'd go to catechism every Saturday on the Sabbath. But uh, then we would have class. We would go upstairs and go to confession. And we'd go in the little booth and tell the uh, priest all of our sins, which is always embarrassing. But, uh, and he would tell us, okay, you need to do some penance. So he would give us a certain number of prayers to do. Our fathers or Hail Marys or acts of contrition. And we'd go out and we'd sit there in the pews and do those prayers. And we were always trying to mumble through them real quickly because we didn't want to be out there too long because the recess was next and we knew our friends would be out there pretty quick. And if we were in there, you know, too long, when we came out, they'd be like, wow, you were in there doing, saying your penance a long time. Father must have given you a lot of penance to do. What did you do? So the... Uh, it never, no one ever got what the nuns were always trying to scare us with. You know, say, if you do too many sins, Father will give you a whole rosary to say. I don't know if you guys know what a rosary is. Beaded chain, beads spaced together every so often, and then it has a crucifix, hang, crucifix hanging off the end, and each bead, depending how it represents it, either on Our Father or Hail Mary or Act of Contrition. But uh, I never saw anyone out there coming out of confession and holding their rosary, looking around, doing their... But uh, anyway, the purpose of that was 
so that we could be absolved of our sin. So that we could go to uh, take communion the next day at church with a clear conscience. Of course, it never worked out that way. We always sinned between confession and, and communion the next day. But we were told all we had to do is when we were lining up for communion to ourselves, we didn't have to say it out loud or move our lips like we did when we were doing our penance after confession so that everybody could see that we really were doing those prayers. We could just say to ourselves in act of contrition, we'd be clean. The point is we had to do, we had to do something to be absolved of our sins. We were worshiping apparently a, a one, another Jesus, one that apparently couldn't wash away our sins all by himself, by his own power, even though he was God, supposed to have infinite power, supposed to have died on the cross to wash all our sins away. Not according to the Catholics. But anyway, by the time I was 15, I had kind of just turned my back on all that. Became an atheist. And then, you know, atheists worship another Jesus. Well, they don't worship another Jesus. They deny him. They deny the one that we worship. They think this other Jesus was just an ordinary man. But he was a good man. Very, very good man. A very, very wise man. But he was not God. But he, he said he was. They admitted that. And I always, and, and, and you had to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. What Jesus is this that you're talking about? It doesn't sound like the one, if he's not the one that uh, actually is God. And how is it that he is so wise? Would a really wise man claim to be God if he was not? Would a good man claim that? And that led to the formulation and. I think all of you have heard of it. Jesus was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He was either the Lord, who was God, or he was lying about it, or he was crazy. And he thought he was God when he wasn't. So there's another, another Jesus. Well, as it turns out, atheism, it leads, it leads to nihilism. There's no God and no such thing as good and evil. There's no sin. But really, then, it doesn't really matter. Nothing really matters. It doesn't matter what you do or anyone else does. It, other people might do things that you don't like. You might do things you don't like. But it's not sin. There's no morality. Nothing really matters. It leads to nihilism. Which leads to desperation. And, you know, I looked at other faiths, kind of glanced at them, but nothing really rang true until I finally was at the point of desperation where I was desperately trying to find my way back to Jesus. I thought I was coming back to Jesus. I, I don't think I'd ever really been saved before then. And guess what caught my attention? I was looking for a Sabbath-keeping church, faith, Seventh-day, something, because that was the one question that never got answered for me in catechism. Is how did the Seventh-day get turned into the first day? Well, the broadcast of the world tomorrow caught my attention. That was Herbert W. Armstrong, the Worldwide Church of God. And he had a Jesus for me to worship, sort of. He taught that, uh, really, Jesus, God the Son, and indeed God the Father, were merely highly, highly, highly evolved and exalted humans. And that, in fact, they had once been like us, just ordinary men. And that we 
one day it would be like them. We would just keep evolving into higher and higher, more exalted human beings. Of course, I liked that idea. I thought, well, so I can be like God one day? That'd be awesome. Of course, I had forgotten that lesson early, early in the Bible story of what got us all into this mess to begin with was a certain serpent told Eve, and Eve told Adam that if we just partake, partook of the forbidden fruit, we could be like God. And that did not work out. So, but that was another Jesus. A Jesus who is just a highly exalted human being. He's not the real Jesus. We are not in evolving into members of the God family. So that basically that idea though, I, I, I lost interest in that eventually. I think that was just God working in my life before I realized it. But I, I did look into some other Sabbath keeping churches. And uh, I went to a Seventh day Adventist church a couple of times. I didn't feel comfortable there. I didn't know why. I didn't know anything about theology. I didn't know anything about Jesus. The things I needed to know, I tried to Church of God Seventh day. It wasn't until later when I actually found, started finding out about the true Jesus that I found out that the Seventh-day Adventist, at least in the beginning, and to a certain extent, even now, they uh, worship a Jesus who is, somehow needs us to do something so that he can save us, so he can wash our sins away. And we need, with the Adventist, we need, we need to go to church on the seventh day to be saved. It's same as in Armstrongism. That's kind of like when I was a Catholic and we needed to do penance, walk, wash our sins away, be pure again. So there was that other Jesus again. Well, eventually I moved to Southern California. They had found out about the Seventh-day Baptist Church. I started going to a Seventh-day Baptist Church and it Simultaneously, I, on the radio, the church, driving around, and I found a radio, a Christian radio station, and they did a Christian apologetics all afternoon after church, every Sabbath. They didn't know it was done for the Sabbath. They didn't believe that, but they were Orthodox Christians. Sabbath is actually not an essential of faith. I learned the essentials of faith, the ones that are necessary for you to be able to believe in the true Christ so you can commit to the true Christ and accept his free will offering of mercy and redemption. And I came up with an acronym for it. And I've shared it with you before. It's a, it's not an acronym. It's a mnemonic, a way of memorizing something. And that mnemonic was seventh. Was each line I put at the beginning, the first word of, uh, the first letter of each word was represented something other than the word it was in the mnemonic. The mnemonic was the first line, seventh. Second line, day. Third line, Baptist. Fourth line, our Sabbatarian. Fifth line, Trinitarian. Seventh day Baptist, our Sabbatarian, Trinitarian. Yes, and seventh stood for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. Nothing else is necessary. Nothing else is possible. We just have to have faith so we can accept grace. And remember, Remember, faith is commitment, and it's based on belief, and it's based on evidence. And, you know, we've talked about that before. But even that faith, 
the ability to have that faith so you can make that commitment. I think that is also a gift of God to us. I don't think we ever, without God's intercession, would come to faith. So, so if we, God, the Holy Spirit comes to us and makes us capable once again of believing in Him. We, have, we can make that commitment of faith so that we can accept the free will offering of grace from Jesus for Him to be the one who absolves of us all our sins through his power only. The DNA day stood for deity of Christ. Christ we worship is God, God the Son. He's part of, well, I'll get to the Trinity in a second. The being Baptist stood for bodily resurrection of Christ. The Christ we worship rose again bodily from the grave. There are some pseudo-Christian sects that believe that uh, Christ arose only spiritually from the grave, which is actually a self-contradiction. We all survive the death, death of our bodies spiritually. But the resurrection is a bodily Resur you know, the body coming back to life. So bodily resurrection is redundant, but that's okay. We need to be, need to be specific. And then the R, Sabbatarians, the A and the S stood for absolute sufficiency of his grace. Absolute sufficiency of his atonement in our behalf. You know, it's only by his blood and his resurrection that our sins are can be absolved. No other, nothing else is necessary, nothing else is possible. And the T and Trinitarian stood for Trinity. Jesus, the Jesus we worship is one of the three persons of the Trinity. God, and so every member of that Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are all God. One God, three persons. One being, three persons. A single who, three what, or I'm sorry, a single what, three who's. Anyway, Once I got all that straightened out, I uh, ended up being glad. I came across one more other Jesus that I'll share with you today. It was like early, it was like, like within three years of me starting to even go to church and study apologetics and getting my head on straight about what Orthodox Christianity is. And there was a movement, a revival, in, I think 1993, 94 is when it really started. And a friend from church, I won't say who, heard about it. And he told me about it. He said, we should go check this out. I hear some really great things are happening. Lo and behold, I'd heard about it too on Apologetics Radio. And they were saying that some things were going on that were not so great there. Right? We said, okay, let's go and we'll check it out and we'll see. It was called the Toronto Blessing. Do any of you remember that? Yeah. It was here. Saved a link so I could. It was a charismatic movement. Revival it started in uh, Toronto, Canada. It supposedly started in Toronto Airport at the Vineyard Church there. Anyway, 
things that were going on there it was very charismatic it had a a lot of uh oh, a lot of love going on where you'd meet these people you know when you go into a cult as an individual everyone in the cult love bombs you how you great you are how wonderful you are and uh just, you know, how beautiful you are and this and that. And, you know, you, you, you just, you know, love, you get into that, all that love. Well, the Toronto Blessing people, they were going around and each one of them as an individual and his group were love bombing everyone they met. So you didn't have to go to their group. But anyway, you know, they had a lot of being slain in the spirit, you know, a lot of uh, what they called holy laughter, uncontrollable, a lot of euphoria, crying. Healing of emotional wounds and stuff like that. So we went to this. First of all, the guy up front was, he was like they all were very happy and, you know, pleasant and, and, and joyful. He was, you know, speaking to us and he spoke to us and then he took questions. And, you know, some people in the audience, you know, had some questions and some of them were a little pointed. And when he got a question that we were asking to justify all of his teachings, all of a sudden his mood changed. And I was warned about this. I heard about it. All of a sudden, they're not as happy and joyful and friendly. They, their mood changes. They get a little darker and they little get a little annoyed. And you keep pressing, they'll get angry. So that was one clue. But the one that got me was the one that saw me, you know, that really made apparent that they were worshiping another Jesus, not the true Jesus, was when uh, he was talking and he had, you know, some others there that would come up, you know, and share their story with him about their conversion, their experience with the uh, Toronto blessing. And one of them was a young woman and she, while she was talking, she started Convulsing. It's just spasms. And eventually, you know, it got where she couldn't really talk very well. He said, you know, she's doing this. She does this every once in a while. She's basically, she's being born again. Again. So that was one clue. Being born again, again. She's, you know, kind of routinely is born again on an ongoing basis. Eventually, she had to go off to the side, you know, so that he could keep on talking. And she just kept there convulsing. And then a, another young woman who had come up and testified uh, with him came, ran up to her and put her hand on her. And she started convulsing, too. And there, the two of them, they're convulsing. And then eventually a third woman came up and put her hand on the second woman. They all were, three of them were just standing off to the side of the stage convulsing, you know, having these spasms. And it was them supposedly being born again, as they often do. And I thought, wait, the Jesus I worship, we were born again because he absolved us of our sins all by himself, his work, his sacrifice, his death on the cross, his blood that washed away our sins. His resurrection from the grave was all him. And it was once we believed in him, put our faith in him, accepted his free will offering of grace and absolution of our sins from him, that was a point of salvation. That's when we became saved. That is when we were born again. And it was then and it was final. Didn't have to do it anymore. So, you know, sanctification is an ongoing process as you grow closer and closer to Christ and to God through your life. And it's ongoing, but being born again is once and for all and forever. And you don't ever have to do it again. And you can't ever do it again because you're already saved. You're already born again. Anyway, that is when uh, that is when 
all of the uh, training and, and the teaching that I had received as a Seventh-day Baptist and through Christian apologetics on the radio and, and in other ways. That is when all that teaching ministry paid off for me. And it brought me to, at that moment, to Second Thessalonians. And that's when I realized that the Toronto blessing was, so-called Toronto blessing was, indeed, you know, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Anyway, so just to quickly review, Christ we worship, true Christ, the one through whom we are saved by grace alone, through faith in him alone. Christ we worship is God, God the Son. Christ we worship rose bodily from the grave. Christ, we worship the true Christ, died on the cross so that we could be saved. And his work of salvation for us is absolutely sufficient for the atonement of our sins. Nothing needs to be added to it, nothing can be added to it. The Christ, we worship, is in communion and always has been for eternity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Any Christ, any Jesus that doesn't fit into those categories is another Jesus, one you need to be aware of, and one you need to reject. Anyway, let's just give thanks real quick for Christ coming into our lives and being the true Jesus for us. Lord, we thank you so much that you did die on the cross for us, that you did absolve us of our sin once for all and forever, and that you are with us through the Holy Spirit, and that you will return to us both in body and spirit on that great day of glory when you will gather all of us up to be in your church, to be your bride, and to spend the rest of eternity with you in fellowship with you and one another. We just like to ask you, Lord, help us persevere through these difficult times when so many other Jesuses are showing up and trying to lead us astray. I'd like to ask you, Lord, to give us courage, clarity of mind, and whatever else we need for us to be able to witness to others about your great glory so that others may be saved. I'd like to ask you, Lord, also to be with us the rest of this Sabbath day and let us enjoy your fellowship and fellowship with one another, and help us to make the final move to the new home that we, you have provided for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Now let's go out, well, first to the fellowship hall, then from there to our new location. From there for the rest of the day and the rest of the week out into the mission field, proclaim Christ, proclaim it with his authority and his power. Let it be so, Lord. Amen. <laughs>